Thank you for listening to Suspect Convictions, a podcast produced in partnership with Scott Reeder and WVIK. WVIK serves everyone, and all kinds of listeners contribute to keep it strong. Your contribution right now is the best way to ensure the future of this podcast and of WVIK, Quad Cities, and PR. Give online at wvik.org. Thank you for your support. The streetlights come on. It's getting dark. She's supposed to be home before the streetlights come on. She wasn't home yet, so I'm thinking she's just out there playing with a friend. She never came home. She should be playing with a friend. She should be going to school and enjoying herself. I'm not strangled, murdered, and uh, treated like a piece of garbage. Seeing her laying there smoldering is tore you up. It's one of those cases that never leave you. And Stanley's making sure of that. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind or heart that they have the right man. We looked at and or processed 10,000 items of evidence and never found anything that connected Jennifer and Stanley. I mean, I like cheese, but I'm not a rat. I like kids, but not like that. You're listening to Suspect Convictions, a podcast from WVIK and Scott Reader. I'm Lacey Scarmana. And this is Chief Judge Marlita Grieve of Scott County, Iowa, opening up the first day of preliminary hearings in the Stanley Liggins case. All right, we are here today in the matter of the state of Iowa versus Stanley Liggins, case number FECR 147696. Mr. Liggins is here along with his attorneys, Derek Jones and Miguel Puentes. And the state is present through Scott County Attorney Mike Walton and Assistant County Attorney Julie Walton. As she said, Stanley was present in the courtroom. He was wearing a bright orange Scott County Jail jumpsuit and shackles. He also had on tinted glasses. Uh, Kent Simmons, the lawyer who represented Stanley through about 20 years of the appeals process, says Stanley suffered from glaucoma while in prison and is now blind in one eye. So, Scott, I'm sure he looks a bit different now than he did when you interviewed him from the jail in 1990. He looks much different. Um, back then, uh, he was young. He was in his 20s. He was very buff. He was very strong, very healthy. He seemed now to be, I don't want to use the word frail, but, you know, he's obviously aged. I mean, as we all have over the last quarter century. Uh, a little bit grayer. Um, he was blind in one eye. He, I think, in a certain sense, I think he would come off before a jury in a more sympathetic way um, to look at him. He's not as, you know, young. I mean, and I think that that, that may play to his advantage. He he seemed to be struggling a little bit. Um, I think, in fact, he had to take a bathroom break because they said that he was taking a water pill which usually is given for um, high blood pressure. So you couldn't help but feel a little bit, I don't want to say sorry for him, but, I mean, he was struggling. He was in shackles, and he was struggling to get a drink of water with his handcuffs shackled up. And, and of course, when he has this, when he comes up for trial, he'll probably be in a suit and tie instead of an orange jumpsuit and some things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, he looked very different than I remembered him. So there were three days of motion hearings. Both the prosecution and defense had filed motions on things like suppressing certain witness testimony, introducing new witnesses that haven't been called before, and a few others. We'll look at those more in depth in future episodes. In fact, Judge Grieve hasn't ruled on all of them yet, so we'll certainly keep you updated as those rulings come in. Uh, But the big one that Judge Grieve has ruled on is the change of venue. Defense attorneys Derek Jones and Miguel Puentes argued that Stanley Liggins would not be able to get a fair trial in Scott County. Judge Grieve approved that motion and moved the trial to Waterloo, Iowa. That's in Black Hawk County. We've touched on how race has impacted this trial, and of course, Stanley Liggins has been convicted by two all-white juries. We've discussed how jury representation could potentially play into a verdict. Uh, Scott, what are the demographics of Waterloo? Well, Black Hawk County is the most racially diverse county in Iowa. It's 9% African American. So 
Well, most places would not consider that play, that particularly racially diverse. By Iowa standards, that's a very racially diverse community. Um, it's you know a very historically blue collar manufacturing community. John Deere makes its tractors there. It's you know it's a community with a rich heritage. Um, Quad Cities, where this crime occurred, Scott County has a seven and a half percent African American population. So. It's slightly more diverse than Scott County, but not radically so. We recently talked to one of the lead investigators on the case, Detective Kevin Murphy. He's retired now, and he says Stanley is in a pretty good spot. You know, he's in a good position right now. You right? Oh, hell yeah. At least got another trial. Um, most of us are old and decrepit. Uh, some witnesses are dead. We're going to uh, change a venue. You know, he's got a lot on his side of the, of the field. Kevin Murphy plans on testifying again in the upcoming trial, but traveling is getting harder for him. He has cancer, and he's alluded to some of the health issues that other witnesses are also living with. And he talked about how difficult it was when the 1995 trial was moved up to Dubuque. You know, and I don't know how they're going to coordinate this mess in Waterloo. I mean, we were running up and down the river from Dubuque, which is an hour and, what, 10 minutes or something? And Waterloo, Iowa, is about two to two and a half hours away from the Quad Cities. In her ruling, Judge Marlita Grieve wrote, and I'm quoting here from the ruling, the court is mindful of the inconvenience caused by moving a trial from one county to another. However, a party's constitutional rights to a fair trial by an impartial fact finder far outweigh any convenience for counsel, witnesses, or the court. So she ruled in favor of the motion because of the evidence in the defense's argument. The defense cited a survey done by personal marketing research. The survey was conducted through phone calls to a sample size of 400 people from the Scott County voter list. The president of PMR testified during one of the hearings that after 27 years, 34% of the population is still aware of either Stanley Liggins or Jennifer Lewis's names, and that more than half the population is aware of a death that happened behind an elementary school. And then she went on to cite more of the study, which showed that 27% of people surveyed have already formed an opinion on whether Stanley Liggins is guilty or not. So that's slightly more than a quarter of people in the potential jury pool that have already made up their mind in this case. So Judge Grieve acknowledged that in her ruling, and she also cited the media coverage as a major reason for why Stanley couldn't have a fair trial here in this community. She wrote that there have been 100 articles published over the last 20 years. Um, 33 of those have been published since 2010. And Scott, she specifically mentioned a column that you published in 2009. And it has kind of a provocative headline. It says, you don't believe in monsters, remember Stanley Liggins. Do you want to explain that? Okay. Let me preface this by saying that this ran in um, 2009, before Stanley Liggins conviction had been overturned, and a lot of the errors that had been revealed since um, were obviously unknown at the time. But let me read what, the, um, what was cited in there. And this is a personal column. It's written in the first person uh, about my exposure to this case. And it's written on the 19th anniversary of Jennifer Lewis's death. My four-year-old sometimes is afraid of monsters, under the bed or in the closet or behind the shower curtain. I reassure her and tell her monsters aren't real. But I know differently. A man, Stanley Liggins, was arrested and locked up in the Rock Island County Jail. He called an editor and demanded to be interviewed by a female journalist, not by the man who had written him. The editor sent a female reporter to accompany me, just in case he wouldn't talk to a man. But he did. He leered through the plexiglass at the young woman sitting behind me, also named Jennifer. He whispered sexual innuendos across a phone line while staring at her. What I saw was evil. I'm not going to share everything he said that day. Some of the words haunt me. Educated folks aren't supposed to believe in evil. We talk about mental illness, bad upbringings, 
poverty, domestic abuse, and other factors as reasons people do bad things. That is how I saw the world before I met Stanley Liggins. I looked into his eyes and I saw an absolute absence of conscience. His denials ran hollow. You were actually mentioned twice in the ruling. Judge Grieve also referenced the information in our podcast, Suspect Convictions. I'm quoting from the ruling again here. She writes, this particular podcast solely discusses defendant's case and includes inadmissible and admissible evidence and commentary and opinions from community members. One such comment called defendant scum of the earth. That quote Judge Greed referenced came from conservative talk radio host Jim Fisher in episode eight. The podcast also has a lot of evidence about Stanley's past convictions and drug history that a jury can't hear because it could prejudice them against him. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought that the stuff that Judge Grieve cited as far as the survey made a lot of sense. You know, that seems to be hard data, and it shows a particular strong opinions in the communities regarding this case. I was really perplexed, though, when she cited the podcast in this change of venue order. Um, I, the reason I found it strange is because a podcast is international in its preach. It's not confined to a particular locality. And we're about six weeks out from when we launched our first episode. And so far, it's been downloaded more than 1.6 million times. It's We have fans in the United Kingdom and New Zealand and Australia as well as all over the United States. But I thought it was interesting. She's moving the, one of the reasons she's citing is this podcast. So she's moving the trial from Davenport, Iowa to Waterloo. So I looked up how many times the podcast has been downloaded in the Davenport metropolitan area, which is the Quad Cities. It's been downloaded at this point 8,115 times. Waterloo, which is a smaller metropolitan area, um, during the same period of time, it's been downloaded 7,239 times. So I'm not sure if there's any greater exposure in the Quad City area as there's close to the Waterloo area. We talked to Kathleen Richardson, Dean of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Drake University. She was also an attorney. And she told us that moving trials to a different county is starting to make less and less sense. It is so easy for people, no matter where they are, to access information about um, a situation or a case. Um, so judges are, are increasingly scrambling around trying to, to figure out how to, um, to use different techniques to ensure that, that people can get a fair trial. A simple Google search on Stanley Liggins and Jennifer Lewis turns up a ton of results, including news reports and this podcast. So no matter where the trial is held, people can learn about it. When a jury isn't sequestered during a trial, it's hard to determine if they'll take advantage of that ability to search for information. I guess you just have to um, hope that um, the majority of jurors take their, re their civic responsibility and the judge's cautions seriously and and try to be as as fair and objective as possible but it you know it is a challenge um, especially like you said in the in the day of the uh, the internet where it is so easy to find information about practically anything the podcast actually played another role in the pretrial motions. Before the first hearing started, Scott, our producer Alfredo Monteca, and I were in the courtroom. Defense attorney Derek Jones came up to Scott and asked to talk to him in the hallway for a minute. So, Scott, why don't you tell us what happened? I said, sure. You know, I'm always willing to, I should say, I'm almost always willing to elaborate on a particular story or whatever. And if somebody has a question about it or whatever. So I walked out there. Of course, they didn't have any questions for me. They had uh, two, uh, two subpoenas to serve on me. During the hearing that day, Derek Jones explained what information he wanted from Scott Reeder. We intend to call Mr. Reeder to testify uh, as an impeachment witness for one of the state's witnesses, Frank Rising. Uh, part of Mr. Reeder's reporting uh, in leading up to this trial included reporting about an interview he conducted with Mr. Rising during which Mr. Rising allegedly told
told Mr. Reeder uh, that he had been threatened with prosecution uh, as an accessory to murder if he did not uh, provide information <clears throat> and testify against Mr. Liggins. And uh, should Mr. Rising deny making that statement at the trial, we would then call Mr. Reeder as an impeachment witness. And they said to me at the time, hey, if you turn this over to us, we won't um, call you as a um, witness in the case. And I got thinking about it, and I said, hey, tell you what, uh, I'll take you up on your deal. Uh, I will agree to um, hand over the recording uh, if you agree not to call me. He said, okay. I said, okay, let's go tell the judge. Uh, then he threw a long pause. Well, let me think about that. So then later in the day, I came back to him and, he said, and I said, hey, yo, do you want to talk to the judge now? You know, I don't think I can make that agreement. Scott, I, I don't know if I can guarantee you we won't call you. So at that point, I immediately called my attorney, and he has filed a motion to quash the uh, subpoena. And um, so we're fighting, fighting this issue out. So there might be a hearing on this issue, and we'll let you know if Scott is able to successfully fight the subpoena. When we talked to Kathleen Richardson from Drake University, we asked her about why it could be problematic to subpoena a journalist. I would say that most journalists would, would argue that they should um, al uh, be allowed uh, protection from being called to testify or to um, reveal sources of information or turn over um, unpublished material because they, you know, number one, if they are forced to do that, it will have a chilling effect on, on people being willing to talk to them or give them information. And by doing so, that would hurt the public. But then um, also the, the fact that they would um, not be seen as, as um, unbiased that uh, they don't want to be seen as, as a tool of law enforcement. The other thing that runs through my mind is, you know, they're asking me to turn over um, the recording of an interview, and, you know, I have no problem with sharing that with all of you. But it's not my job as a journalist to do the investigating for either the police or for the defense. My job is simply to produce the facts. The defense has an uh, investigator on staff. He's a former Iowa State trooper. If they want to talk to Frank Rising, why don't they just send their investigator out to Sioux City, Iowa to interview him? I mean, it's not like this is the only place you can get the information that he's shared. It, it, it just, to me, is, is kind of a chilling aspect to put on the, uh, the free press. So we have no problem producing the tape as it's been broadcast, so we'll play it at the end of this episode. As a reminder, though, Frank Rising was Stanley Ligon's cellmate in the Scott County Jail before his first trial. Frank testified in both trials, in 1993 and in 1995. And on the stand, he testified that Stanley Ligon's admitted to killing Jennifer Lewis. This was pretty important testimony for the prosecution, so of course we wanted to talk to Frank. Scott, before we play this full interview, why don't you talk about how you tracked him down? I thought he could be really easy to find because he was being held in a prison in Nebraska. And you know, one thing you can be sure of, if you're in prison, you're not going anywhere for a while. But wouldn't you know it, before I could get out to the prison in Nebraska and interview him, he got released. And... Then I had to try to find him, and he had no address that I could find or anything else, and I hunted and I hunted on the internet, and I managed to locate somebody who I thought was his brother, and he lived out in Sioux City, Iowa. So I decided, well, you know, Sioux City's on the Nebraska border, and I'm just going to drive out to Sioux City and knock on his brother's door and see if he can direct me to, um, to Frank. So I drove out there and knock on the door, and this woman answers the door, and I said, I'm looking for a, a guy named Frank Rising. Can you tell me where I could find him? Nope, we don't know any Frank Rising. And I look in, and there's a man sitting on the sofa. 
And I said, no, not, I'm not buying it. I've seen Frank's picture on Facebook, and you look just like him. You're his brother, aren't you? Well, yeah. I said, well, could I come in and explain to you what I'm looking in for him for? And I came in, and I explained what I was doing. And he, they said, well, we'll call him for you and see if he'd be willing to talk to you. So they call him and hand me the phone. And he goes, I don't want to talk to you. And I go, well, well could you just give me a few minutes? I, I promise it won't take too long. Nope, don't want to talk to you. And uh, we kept going back and forth. And I finally said, hey, guy, I know you've been married. You know, my wife is going to be just kill me if I tell come back to home and don't have an interview for her. She's just going to say, you wasted a couple of days to drive all the way out there and not have anything. Could you just give me a break, guy? Okay, fine. Come on down to the construction site where I'm working, and you can interview me there. So I drive down to um, downtown Sioux City, Iowa, and I meet Frank Rising. He's out troweling concrete when I, when I see him. And we talk for about 15 minutes. Now, Frank's a pretty rough guy. And you can tell, probably tell by um, my questions or how I'm asking him, I'm a little bit um, nervous about the interview. So this is how it started out. Well, that was a, uh, a pretty important thing that you did um, 26 years ago. I was ago. forced to do it. You were forced to do it? How'd that happen? Kind of, you know what I mean? I didn't uh, work in a jail cell with them. I, I knew they did that on purpose, you know, to put me in, in a place where there was somebody else that did something like that. I, did, I didn't know what he did until I got my TV in that night. And, and I told him, I said, that's you, you motherfucker. And he says, yeah, it's me, but they will never get me for it. And, well, they were listening on the, on the speakers. And I, I was brought out of my cell and told I needed to testify or else I'd be charged with accessory after the fact. Were you afraid of him? Fuck no, I was going to kill him. Really? I wanted to kill him, man. I tried to hit him in the courtroom. Man. <sighs> a guy like that had to have a rough time in prison. I mean, he harm a child, though, doesn't he? Yeah, he'd be, he'd be in PC. He'll be in what? PC, protective custody. So, how did he come to say it? Just you're just sitting around. I've well, seen him on the TV. Okay. Had you ever seen him before in the jail or anything? Never met him before in my life. Were you suspicious when they stuck you in the cell with him? Yep. Because they moved me from another cell into that cell block. They knew who I was, man. I was. Back at that time, I was a pretty rough man. Well, I know you've been in and out a lot. How were you a rough man? 25 years, man. 25 years behind, uh, locked up? Yeah. How do, you, how do you cope with that, man? I don't know how I'd do it. I have a problem with people. Well, I hope you don't have a problem with me. <laughs> well, you're standing kind of close. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, tell me about it. I mean, um, Ligon's... You've, you've done 25 years behind bars. You ever run across anybody scarier than Stanley Liggins? Yeah, a lot. A lot? He, he doesn't even make a, a tit on the fly. I mean, he, he's nothing. He's a piece of shit. He needs to be killed. I hope he gets butt raped. I don't want to see him. I've never seen him. I've been doing time for, 20, like I said, 25 years, and I've never come across him. You did some time at Fort Madison. He did some time at Fort Madison, but you weren't there at the same time? No. So? I was sent there at a pretty young age, being a young kid. I stabbed my first dude, my guy, when he was 18. What caused you to stab him? Said he's going to rape me. In, in jail, you mean? He in stabbed prison. Him. Fort Madison. Wow. And you were you drove all the way from Quad Cities? I drove all the way from Springfield, Illinois, three hours further away than the Quad Cities. Are you the one that's been calling me on my phone? Yeah, I've been trying to reach you. <laughs> and, um, because it's, it's really important, um, that we, um, 
that I chat with you. I just, I've talked to almost every witness in the case now, and you were the last one. You see the pictures? I was there. And they showed me the pictures, and it was the, one of the most grossest things I've ever seen before. Well, you know, my story on it, how I got involved in this case, was um, oh, um, 26 years ago, I was a night cop reporter for the Quad City Times. You were a night cop? I was a night cop reporter. I covered the police department. And I got dispatched to a small fire at a school playground, and I didn't know what it was, and I didn't think I was even worth going to. Something, you know, it was a crappy neighborhood, and a lot of fires got people burned their trash out in the vacant lot, and I didn't think much of it. Editor says, go check it out just in case. And I get there, and I get the time, same time as the first cop, and the two of us were walking over towards some tall grass where we saw the fire at. And next thing we know, I'm getting about as close as I am to you right now, and look down, and it's a nine year old girl that's been doused with gasoline. Yeah. It was never seen anything that bad before in my life. That's what the cops said. What cop? Do you remember who the cops were that you worked with? No, I knew them, no. I mean, they knew me. And I was pretty well known in that town. I remember Dave Holden real well back in those days. I know Mr. Holden. Yeah. He was a character. You know, he's, he's, he's since passed on. Uh, and there's Don Schaefer. Did you know him? I know Schaefer. I just, I can't picture the face, but I know the name. Blonde haired guy. Yeah. And there's Kevin Murphy. Mm -hmm. So, well, so how long were you in there with him when he, when he suddenly said that? Uh, probably five, six weeks. Wow. And did you guys talk at all before that? No, nah, I didn't have nothing to do with him. So, like, how do you sit around in a tiny little cell with somebody for five or six weeks and not interact at all? I mean, that's got to be hard. It's pretty easy. What do you do? Just ignore him. I had a TV, so I just watch TV. Did he have a TV too? Or no. Did he sit there and watch it with you? Or? Yeah. Behind me about 10 feet. And um, did you think he was a dangerous guy? No. Why? I mean, he obviously did something. Because anybody that did something like that to a child, I, I mean, very, uh, I just have no respect for somebody like that. So he wasn't no consequence. So did he, um, um, did you stay, I mean, did you have to stay in there after he told that, that to you? Uh, about five days later, I was transferred to Anamosa. Was it a deal? No, it was a, I had a prison sentence. So, I mean, did they, did they give you anything um, for, for helping out? Not really. I mean, I talked to the, one of the defense attorneys, and he said, well, he thought he got, he got a little bit better tr uh, treatment in DOC. He got sent to a nicer prison. Yeah, maybe he got sent to Rockwell City or something. Kind of a luxury resort. <laughs> well, it's Rockwell City's not quite as bad as um, Fort, Fort Madison. Madison. No, it's not. But Fort Madison, you got cable, so. <laughs> and you don't sell, which was a big th It's a big thing. So I was, I was down there... Um, about three months ago, the new prison looks totally different than the old one. Yeah. So, uh, what else sticks that sticks out about Stanley Liggins? I mean, uh, you you spend nothing. that much time. He, he's no consequence, man. He's he he doesn't mean nothing to me. He's he's a piece of shit. What else uh, did he did he did you uh, did he say anything else to you during that time? Like turn the TV off, or did he? Or, um, no, well, or, uh, that man couldn't make me do anything. You know? Now I, I hate to say like this. Like I said, he's a, he has no consequence. Now his first defense attorney, um, Gary McKendrick, who went on to be a judge. I was talking to him, and I said, you know, he said that he talked to some juror, jurors, and they said your testimony was the most uh, persuasive that they heard in the whole trial. Well, that was the truth. A guy like that deserves life in prison. Anybody that could do anything like that to a child, they deserve that. Did, um, you know, Gary, I, I don't take this the wrong way, but this is what he said. He said he couldn't figure out why Gary would, uh, why Stan Lee Liggins would say anything to a, uh, to a white guy uh, who he was locked up with. I mean, he isn't. I was surprised, too. 
I was just watching TV and I told him, I said, that's you. He said, yeah, but they ain't going to get me for it. That's all he said. And that was about the length of our conversation. So when he said he ain't going to get you for it, you took that as him admitting that he did it? Yeah. But they weren't going to catch him. You know, he, he thought he had uh, everything covered. So... What was it like going into the courtroom and having to tell that story? It sucked. Why did it suck? Because I've never told on anybody before in my whole life. And stitches have a rough time of it in prison, don't they? I wasn't considered when I fought my way out of any situation. So nobody considered you a snitch among the prisoners? No. Why is that? Because it was a child killer? Or? Mm -hmm. Nobody has no respect for them. Did you know? Did you ever run across anybody who knew him when you were in, in behind bars? No. Because some people said he was that. probably in PC, so I probably would have never saw him anyway. So they said that um, I was talking to one of the inmates, and they said that some of the Aryan Nation guys at Fort Madison wanted to go after him as soon as he got there. Oh, yep. Were you in a gang when you were in? Nope. How do you survive not being a gang? I fought real good. Back then, I was, a, like I say, I'm getting old now. How old? You're what, 54? Five. 55. Five. Okay, I'm 51. Um, do you have family at all? I mean, kids or? You met my brother. I got uh, two stepkids, three of my own. Your kids live here or? Uh, uh, we live down in Fort Madison where I was in prison. They aren't in Fort Madison, they just live in the town, right? Right. Okay. So, what got you into the most trouble? Was it, was it, um, the, the Fight. fighting? Yeah. And what things did you serve time for when you were, when you were, um, locked up? Used to steal semis, dump trucks, skidsters, backhoes, dracos, uh, jet skis, quad runners, stuff like that. Okay. And you, you know, I, I saw that you've, you've had a lot of DUIs over the years. I mean, yeah. do, do you think you have a substance abuse problem? I quit drinking uh, seven years ago. Was that hard? I believe the good Lord took it away from me. You know, just. Uh, I take it one day at a time. I don't even think about it anymore. You know. Did you do the 12 step thing? Or? No. No? I did the Bible thing. Okay, well tell me about that. There's nothing did you tell. find Jesus in prison or did you? Uh... No, I've been a Christian most of my life. It's just uh, I wasn't walking the path. When did you accept Jesus? I don't know, when I was 10 or 11. Okay. I've been a Christian a long time too. That's why I ask. I mean, it's a tough path. You know, Jesus said it was. He said the road um, is bit narrow for the to, to heaven, broad to hell. Do you think that um, I'm going to ask a strange question? I mean, I, I interviewed, I told you, St Stanley Liggins 26 years ago, and I've never encountered somebody quite like that. I've done stories in prisons before and everything else. He's different, ain't he? He's different. Do you think he might be possessed? I, I don't I don't know I I just know he's a, just a piece of shit. That's all I can say about him. I have no. He's just a piece of shit. He's a bad man. I'm gonna. Ask. There's somebody that can do something like that. He's got to be have something wrong in the head. Well, I I, pulled I seen the pictures and it was it was the grossest thing I've ever I've never seen nothing like that ever again. So, you say that the, the sheriff's department was listening in the whole time. Yeah. And did you know they were listening in? Fuck no. So then they, why couldn't they just say they heard him say it? Well, it's, I don't know. I think it's a privacy act or something. I have no idea. But the, once that he said that to you, they were on you. You say? Yeah. So they didn't. So. They threatened you that they call you an accessory after the fact or something. Uh, it's things I don't want to talk about. I've, I've given you, I've given you 15 minutes and I'm I'm kind of tired. I'm gonna go. Okay.
Can I just ask you one other question? You did may. you tell the truth? Yes. And why did you tell the truth? It was the right thing to do. Have you ever um, snitched on anybody else or been Never. an informant on anybody else? No. Uh, are you proud of um, what you did with with um, the St Liggins case? I have my moments. Okay. Um, do you you know he's going up for trial again in uh, May, don't you? It doesn't have nothing to do with me. Okay. Okay. Well, I, like I said, I'm writing a book and uh, putting together a podcast, and we're using all the recordings for that as well. And we just want to tell the whole story. I appreciate you taking your time for me. It's really You're important. Welcome. Next time on Suspect Convictions, we'll hear how those missing 77 police reports that the defense never received were acknowledged during the pretrial hearing. Mr. Ligon's attorney, Kent Simmons, acknowledged that out, out of all those reports, there was only two issues that were relevant. Would having this report have been helpful to the defense during the 1993 trial? Certainly. In what way could this report have been used uh, to help Mr. Ligon's during the 1993 trial? Well, what, it, what could have been established uh, was that, in fact, the FBI uh, did not verify an alibi. That's next time on Suspect Convictions. Production support comes from Alfredo Monteca. A big thanks to Colin Thompson and Cast Media for our online presence. And thank you to WVIK CEO Jay Pierce and the WVIK staff. All archived audio was generously provided by WQAD-TV Channel 8.